My dear friends, today is Quinquagesima Sunday. The second collect is of St. Blaise. The third is to the Blessed Virgin and the saints for the intercession. There is coffee and baked items available for you after Mass today. I do ask you to please remember Mr. Fiore in your prayers, the father of Miss Gloria and Miss Rosanna Fiore. Today is the 45th anniversary of his death. Please remember all those of the parish who are ill. I'd like to remind you of the women's retreat on June the 16th through the 19th. The men's retreat on June the 23rd through the 26th. The boys' camp beginning July the 15th. The girls' camp beginning July the 26th. I ask you to please remember in your pr prayers Mr. Hugh Miller, the father of Mrs. Lisa Capetillo, who passed away last week. I would like to extend special thanks to those of you devout souls who participated in the Rosary Crusade this past week. Although the numbers are very few, it's a very important thing for our church. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. You have the morning blessing of ashes and distribution and mass at 10.30. You have the 6 p.m. administering of ashes and stations of the cross. The stations of the cross will also be this Friday and benediction after the 6 p.m. Mass. With fear and trembling, work out your salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My dear friends, these words of the apostles were addressed not to sinners, but to the just, who seemingly were doing well, who were visibly on the way to saving their souls. The four last things, heaven, hell, death, and judgment, often fill us with a fear and trembling, but that fear and that anxiety is soon forgotten. We soon recover from such anxiety and we return to our former sins. The average Catholic is very casual about his salvation. I think we must all consider ourselves the average Catholic. We look forward with great assurance to heaven as though we've already been given that as our sentence. We don't give great scandal. We don't mortify ourselves too often. We're content with the world. We don't want to leave it. We leave everything up to the redemptive power of Christ. We, we have false modesty proclaiming that we are the most horrible of sinners, and yet we're quite assured of heaven. The fact of concluding that we are not in danger of hell, St. Augustine says, places us in danger of hell. The virtue of humility does not permit one to proclaim that he's already saved. Remember the words of St. Joan of Arc, the great St. Joan, when asked if she was in the state of grace. She wasn't quite sure. She said, if I be not in the state of grace, I ask God to put me there. You and I, my dear friends, are obliged to fear for our salvation and not with false modesty, not with fictitious fear. Our actual goodness is quite small, minuscule compared to our Lord, nothing compared to our Lord. Scripture tells us that the work of salvation is most difficult, it's most uncertain, 
and it demands all of our energies. Our Lord frequently encouraged his apostles and followers to watch and pray. He reminds us of the difficulties of the narrow way, of the tribulations which we must endure. He reminds us of denying ourselves for the cross, of renouncing all of our possessions, of doing violence to ourselves. And then, after he reminds us of all these things, does he tell us how few are chosen? He reminds us of the, neg the negligence of the five virgins, the foolish virgins, who were not prepared for what was ahead. We are told in the book of Ecclesiasticus, man knoweth not whether he be worthy of love or worthy of hatred. The holiest of men were full of fear. David, reflecting upon his own life, St. Paul fearing himself to be a castaway, he who had earned for himself the title, the apostle, Adam being chased from paradise, Samson, the judge of Israel, and Solomon, the wisest of men. All of these feared for their salvation, and rightly so. St. Peter, the prince of the apostles, said no man can consider himself confirmed in grace and sure in et of eternal life. Amongst all the saints, there was a fear of the rigor of justice, of God's judgment. Can we say that their fear was ungrounded? and that they had no solid reasons for these conclusions, their salvation, though foreseen by God, was conditional on their humility, on their prayer, and on their perseverance. As long as man has free will, he can move towards God, or he can move away from Almighty God. Yet some men presume where the saints before us have feared to go, where the angels fear to tread, men walk in foolishly. We take great comfort in the sacrament of penance, so we should. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, our Lord said to the apostles. Our contrition, however, is far from perfect. Even if we put away our sins, we still have much to make up for. We must not neglect further penance for our past sins. Think of the hermit who lived in the desert for their sins. Peter who wept daily for his momentary denial of our Lord. We read in the book of Ecclesiasticus, Be not without fear about sins forgiven. Our sins are truly forgiven, but the wound still remains to impede our progress. Thus it's necessary, my dear friends, to do penance for our sins. The penance given to us in the confessional is faint, it's but a shadow of God's severe judgment. Forgiveness of sin in the sacred tribunal is far from what we need. Sanctifying grace is essential but does not entail the grace of final perseverance. You can't merit that grace. You must pray for it. We cannot presume that perseverance will take care of itself or that it is secured by an ordinary confession. Even if all of our confessions are valid, even if all of our communions are admirable, this does not ensure grace against Satan's
final assault. If at last grace fails us and mortal sin comes, then it is in the depths of hell forever for us. We see 40 men on a frozen lake in Sebast, all 40 having, part, having in part participated in martyrdom. And behold, one of them does not receive that grace of final perseverance. He leaves his brethren in the cold water. He goes and offers incense to the God, and then he warms himself in the heated water, and he dies from shock and apostasy. Again in Japan, two of the companions of Blessed Spinoza, Spinota, had endured with him three years of horrible imprisonment for the faith. They were condemned at last to death, and they endured hours of slow burning. Almost dead, two of these companions of Blessed Spinota abjured their faith and were withdrawn from the torture. Thinking they have saved themselves, the magistrate looks at them and feels that they are too far gone beyond medical help. He throws them back into the flames. They die apostates when just a few more minutes they would have obtained a martyr's crown. There had been doubtless some abuse of grace in their forgotten past. Some sin, a forgiven one perhaps, which temporal debt had remained unexpiated. We must make up for our sins. Have we not reason to fear for our salvation with our tepid lives in spite of the merits and graces we gain in the sacraments, in extreme unction, in holy viaticum, have they merited us so little? It's not because of the powerful sacraments. It's not because of the power of the blessed sacrament. It's our weakness, our frailness. How many of us have begun our lives well and have broken down in the middle of the race? The lost, those in hell, are by no means made up of those who have always been plunged into wickedness. Almost all the souls in hell have known days of innocence, days of goodness, have given good promise of perseverance, good promise of ending well, and yet they didn't. Let us not rely on the many wonderful escapes we have had in the past. For if we do, we tire God of his patience. Let us think of the responsibilities God's grace bestows upon us. St. Luke tells us to whom they have committed much, of him they will demand the more. You have been blessed exceedingly to have the traditional Mass perhaps in large part due to the efforts of your parents. Do not waste that. Do not squander those graces. Can any, any of us say that we have done some good work for God? We all can say that. But are we the ones responsible or are we his instruments? Have we already received the reward of praise from fellow men here on earth rather than the rewards from God? Can we be cast into the same hell as those who openly attack religion and morality? Certainly they have a special place in hell. Can we be cast into that same hell? Well, let's ask the other question. Can we go to that same heaven where the likes of St. Francis the likes of St. Maria Goretti, 
the likes of St. Joan are, as star differeth from star, so those who enter into hell, and so those who enter into heaven. God's precious blood can satisfy for the shortcomings of the whole race of sinners. The deathbed is the special battlefield and theater of his mercies. Thousands of sinners turning then to God on their deathbed for the first time have been snatched out of the very jaws of hell. Yet we must bear in mind the words of St. Augustine, He who created thee without thy assistance will not save thee without thy assistance. Human cooperation is necessary to, for our salvation. Human cooperation must assist divine action. When we are filled with fear and trembling for our salvation, then, my dear friends, we are a little closer to heaven, a little closer to salvation. St. Augustine tells us that no one, however holy, should dare to present himself at the judgment seat of God without first having done penance, without secondly having given alms, which covereth a multitude of sins, and without thirdly having prayed for the grace of final perseverance. It's very important the enrollment in the miraculous medal. That enrollment gives you the promise of final perseverance. God love you and God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.